Good evening and hello. On behalf of the Smithsonian, I wanna welcome you all to the opening of Claiming Space, a virtual symposium on black futures, past, present, and potential. My name is Kevin Strait, and I'm a museum curator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Our symposium is part of a multi-museum initiative between the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the National Air and Space Museum, and the National Museum of African Art. Our programs were initially funded through the Smithsonian's Year of Music campaign. And tonight's program is part of an ongoing series focusing on a variety of topics and themes related to the expansive and dynamic field of Afrofuturism. From tonight until the 29th, our virtual symposium will consist of thought-provoking discussions from scholars, journalists, critics, and artists to examine the ever-expanding reach of Afrofuturism and explore the different ways the genre is claiming and reclaiming space from land and sea to the infinite spaces of the cosmos and the digital frontiers. Beginning tomorrow at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we'll have a panel on the aquatic space and dis, uh, discussing water and oceans in the Afrofuturist imagination, followed by a discussion on terrestrial spaces and reclaiming landscapes, monuments, and communities in Afrofuturist expression and cultural movements. And Friday evening, we'll conclude with a discussion of music and Afrofuturism, featuring Vernon Reed of the group Living Color. And on Saturday, we'll begin at 10 a.m. with a panel to discuss cyberspaces and political activism in the dig digital age, followed by a panel on personal space to discuss Afrofuturism's focus on the body, outer space projecting histories and futures onto the stars in the Afrofuturist imagination. And we'll conclude our symposium Saturday afternoon with a discussion from visual artist and filmmaker Phoebe Boswell, and choreographer and performer Norma, excuse me, Nora Chipamire. And that program will be hosted by curator and scholar, Dr. Isolde Brielmeyer. Tonight, we begin our symposium with Space on the Page, a conversation between authors, Eve Ewing and Kevin Young. Hailing from Chicago, Dr. Eve L. Ewing is a sociologist and an author, most recently of the book for, uh, of a book for young readers called Maya and the Robot a poetry collection titled 1919, and the nonfiction work, Ghosts in the Schoolyard, Racism and School Closings on Chicago's South Side. She has received awards for the year's best books by NPR and the Chicago Tribune and from the American Library Association and the Poetry uh, Society of America. She, is also, she also currently writes the Champion series for Marvel Comics and previously wrote the acclaimed Ironheart series, as well as other projects. Dr. Ewing is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago, and her work has been published in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, The New York Times, and her next book, Original Sins, The Miseducation of Black and Native Children, and The Construction of American Racism, will be published on One World. Kevin Young is a renowned poet, author, essayist, and editor, who has written 11 books of poetry, two works of nonfiction, and is the editor of 10 other works, including African American Poetry, 250 Years of Struggle and Song former director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. Kevin was also the Charles Howard Candler Professor of Creative Writing in English at Emory University in Atlanta, as well as the curator of Emory's Raymond Donowski Poetry Library. Currently, Kevin is the Andrew W. Mellon Director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Before we begin our program, we'd like to thank everyone once again for taking the time to join us tonight, and we hope for our following sessions on Friday and Saturday. We'd also like to dedicate tonight's program to our friend and colleague, Ms. Katrina Hill, who passed away during the pandemic. Katrina was a dedicated museum professional and a treasured friend who was part of the original team that helped bring these programs to light and tonight is dedicated to her memory. Once again, we thank you for joining us and without further ado, here's tonight's program. Thank you. Howdy everyone, it's good to see you, good to see you Eve. Hi, it's so good to see you. Oh, I feel like the last time I saw you was on stage somewhere. Um, yeah, it was actually one of the last like pre-pandemic events I did. It was the the Black Comics Festival in New York. I know. Well, January of 2020. That's amazing to think. Well, and I want to talk about comics and especially your role in them in a moment. But I want to think of a little bit about sort of a you write around so many genres, and I think genre is something that Afrofuturism both is interesting in, in and interested in exploding, right? Right, and so right. I wonder how, how you think of your sociological work uh, 
does it influence your poetry or your nonfiction? How does it, how do all these things interweave for you? Yeah, thanks for that question. You know, I, I think sometimes about social constructs as though like if I were stranded on a desert island or if I had amnesia or if I were an alien from another planet, is this a thing I would organically invent? And I think that if I were left, like if somehow the reinvention of human civilization were left up to me, I would, I don't think I would ever come up with such a thing as genre. I don't think about it too much. You know, I, I really see myself as a person who has a set of questions and stories I want to tell. And I'm willing to kind of grasp at whatever tools are available to me um, to do that. But I, I think I think that the types of things that you're trained to do as a sociologist and the types of things that you're trained to do as a poet in particular are very similar. And for me, the biggest area of overlap in both of those types of writing is um, close looking. So, you know, as you know, um, as both of us know, uh, to me, part of what my, a lot of my favorite poems are poems that are really exercises and looking really closely at something that other people are, are apt to, you know, kind of let pass by. And I think that sociology and the social sciences also is about, you know, um, as one of my mentors, Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot puts it, you know, making the familiar unfamiliar and making the unfamiliar familiar, taking time to ask questions about things that other people take for granted. So I feel really lucky that I get to be a professional question asker in both of those arenas. Well said. And what a great quote. I think a lot about, uh, my mentor in some senses. Uh, she picked my first book, Lucille Clifton, and her always quoting, you know, the goal of poetry is to comfort the afflicted and afflict yes. the comfortable, you know, and that kind of idea that discomfort isn't the worst thing in the world and right. familiarity is one of our goals. And uh, that's really well put. I wonder about space, and I don't mean outer space, but geography. Even though um, you see my space cast that I want? I mean, I so I admire it, you know. <laughs> I, I came unprepared. I feel like I didn't, you know, yeah, you didn't get right memo. For, for the occasion, but uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm gonna try. Um, so for me, you, you know, obviously you're from Chicago and it's central to a lot of your work. And I wonder how you approach space, you know, uh, how do you think about geography um, and specifically Chicago, Bronzeville? How do you write about it? How do you approach it? Is it a, a kind of world for you, a, a universe like it was for Gwendolyn Brooks, say? Oh, wow. I mean, I mean, I try to do anything and everything I can like Gwendolyn Brooks. I, you know, I think um, hearing you ask that question in the very um, eloquent way that you did actually makes me think that I kind of under theorize physical space. So I think that um, I think about place a lot. And a lot of my writing is through place. Right. So I write through Chicago and I try with humility to write in the tradition of, you know, what I would consider a kind of Chicago literary legacy, including people like Gwendolyn Brooks and people like Carl Sandburg, people like Sandra Cisneros, um, you know, people like Lorraine Hansberry, and I could go on and on. Um, but hearing the way you ask the question actually makes me think about like space, like the physical space that we inhabit. And and I, I take that actually as a challenge that that's something I should think about a little bit more um, a little bit differently. I think one thing that I, I think a lot of my writing is um, very preoccupied with different iterations of ghosts and phantoms. And I do think that we inhabit space. Uh, this is like, we're, this is the first night of this event. So it's time for us to go right to the, yeah, weird, let's do it. Go right to the weird stuff. I think that we inhabit space with people and spirits and entities that we can't see. Um, and I think that that belief is certainly rooted in a kind of, you know, spirituality, but I think actually equally rooted in uh, physics and astrophysics and right. That, that a, a large proportion of the universe um, is, you know, matter that we are not able to see or interact with using sure. the tools of perception available to us or the technologies available to us. So in my work that comes up thinking a lot about like how we share space with ghosts um, and what it means to inhabit places and areas that, you know, where these spirits kind of dwell, how we interact with them, how we acknowledge them, how we make space for them. Um, so yeah, I wanna, I wanna keep thinking about that some more. I, you know, I, I'm like getting to know architects and designers and people like that ha contribute to this idea that I have under theorized space and I wanna think about it further. Well, I can't wait to see what you come up with. <laughs> Thanks. I, I, I do also think a lot about that you've already doing, done some of this with ghosts, like you said. Uh, my second book was called <clears throat> To Repel Ghosts, which is a phrase from Jean-Michel Bascat. So 
maybe I believe him. I'm not sure, but I try to keep him as far as possible. I got blue glass set up in <laughs> places to prevent such a um, visitation. But you, and one of my favorite poems, uh, flat out, and I used to read it a lot when I was reading from the anthology that you're in, the African-American Poetry Anthology that came out. I mean, it's hard to believe it's 2020 when it came out. But, that can't uh, be. Yeah, it was I, and I just want to, you know, I don't know if I've ever gotten a thank you to your face for since since it since it came out. Um, it just means so much to me. It means everything to me to be included in, in this volume. Um, there it is. Um, anybody and everybody. It's it's really one of the great honors of my my young life. So I just oh, want to take the opportunity to thank you. Thank but you. go on. Um, well, your poem uh, to Emmett Till, uh, you know, kind of imagines him uh, seeing him at the supermarket. Right. And um, it's a poem that I think so captures this what I'm kind of interested in and trying to get at, and some of what you said about ghosts, but also about presences. His presence, of course, is so central to the museum. Right. And, um, you know, his casket is there that we uh, uh, restored. And, you know, it's such a powerful moment. I think of Mamie Tim Mobley, who's getting some attention now and thinking of her bravery, right? right. What to you is sort of the technology or the, the Afrofuturism of the past in a way? And how does Till's presence sort of still resonate right now? I mean, does it tell us something about the future as well? Yeah. You know, I went to wipe my glasses and I think I made them worse. Um, I really appreciate that. And I actually think that um, that poem is at the core of my attempts to articulate an Afrofuturist politic, aesthetic, uh, theoretical framework, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I really appreciate that kindness and generosity you've shown in, in bringing the poem to the world. Uh, part of, so as, as you know, and uh, as I haven't shared too much with too many people, but as I shared with you a little bit, um, I've been working for a few years on trying to write this book called the Afrofuturist Dialogues, which is um, like, it's written in the style of a Socratic dialogue. So it's two um, fictional characters that are both kind of me talking to each other about Afrofuturism. And one of the things I've been trying to untangle is the ways in which I actually think of Afrofuturism as a little bit of a misnomer. So, um, and, you know, I sometimes think if Black people had named Afrofuturism, if we would have come up with a different word and like if we should now or if it's the, the ship has sailed. But I think that what, for me, the way I think of Afrofuturism is not so much that it is only about a future, but that more broadly, it troubles our relationship to linear time. And that, it, and that it invites us to think about time as being cyclical, as being eternally kind of recurring, um, which is a vision of time that is very common in a lot of non-Western societies and a lot of parts of history. And that, um, you know, to a certain degree, our attachment to linear time is very related to our attachment to capitalism. Um, that, you know, capitalism demands that we clock in and clock out and that there are beginnings and endings. And I think that for Black people across the diaspora, there are many ways in our everyday life that we invite thinking about time in a different way. Um, I wrote an essay a few years ago about um, about how African American vernacular English has a, a way of talking about the past of the past that standard English doesn't. So if I said, if you said, Eve, did you take out the trash? Yeah, I said, I've been took out the trash. <laughs> Not just that I took out the trash, <laughs> but I took before before I said I've been took out the trash. How dare you ask me? Right? Right, like, exactly. There's nothing like I've been that. that. Like what's your I've been with that. that. I've been with <laughs> that. Right. I've been knowing that, right? I, so when someone says I've been knowing, right? That they're, they're bringing in this idea of the habitual be, right? Which moves into the future, but but I've been knowing. So it goes from the past I, to the I present to the future, right? And so there's nothing like that in standard American English, right? Yeah. Not, that doesn't exist. And so all of which is a roundabout way of coming back to your question, um, which is that part of, for, for me, um, Right, at my Afrofuturist practice means that is is inextricable from thinking about the past, and that I only, in a sense, know how to talk about a future through the valence of talking about history. And so, therefore, a lot of my work is trying to sometimes in you know um, very melancholy ways, like in that poem, and sometimes in more silly ways. Um, but to kind of poke a stick at the the boundary between the past, the present, and the future, and to invite the past into the present in what I hope are creative and interesting or provocative ways, uh, and to kind of just, yeah, just, you know, smudge it a little bit. 
I think it's so important. And, you know, one of the things Kevin Strait, who is I'm so excited, is is curating this Afrofuturism exhibition that'll be up, I think, next March, uh, March 2023, the future, speaking of the future. Um, <laughs> we're going to be here soon. And this uh, symposium, I think, is starting to think through uh, publicly some of those ideas um, that we're also going to talk about in the museum. But we have the mothership in the museum, you know. The literal like, mothership, there. yes. yes. <laughs> Parliament Funkadelic. So it's already there. It's already being thought about, the future and the past. And I love how you describe them being united. Um, and, you know, I think one of those things is uh, the ideas that Kevin, I think, has been so brilliant about um, is talking about Afrofugium starting in the 19th century, you know, mm -hmm. it start yesterday it doesn't start tomorrow it's it, it's done been uh right, right. Futurist, right um and so how do we understand that I, I love that you put that can we hear a little bit of that you had uh you have just like a little sample sure one of the voices this is a dangerous do you want to do it with me i'll do both voices if you're scared no, no, I got it. okay great great I'm, I'm but so i want deep. to stress to people this is not my questions these are <laughs> yes these are both me. dialogues questions. these are both me okay all right, right but you have to way. you have to start so why is this book written in the style of some greek philosophers who lived over two thousand years ago because i think i know a lot about afrofuturism but I think there are a lot of things about Afrofuturism that are still unsettled. So rather than write a book where I pretend to know everything, I thought it would be interesting to ask a bunch of questions. For some of these questions, I think there are pretty clear answers that most people would agree on. For other questions, I have my own personal perspectives, but lots of other smart people might disagree with me. And in some cases, I really don't know the answers to the questions. So I thought writing them down would be a good way to work them out. And if I can't work them out, I'm at least putting them out there for other people to come along and argue about. All right. That reminds me, didn't Socrates say something like the wisest man knows that he knows nothing? Yeah, yeah. something along those lines. Interesting. OK, well, now that I know why the, what the, why the book looks like this, seeing as I spent money on it, or at least went out of my way to pirate it, can you tell me what Afrofuturism is now? Sure. Afrofuturism is the premise that Black people exist in the future. That's it. That's pretty simple. Now I don't even have to read the whole book. This is this person is mean, by the way. <laughs> There's not any actual reader who's been dying to ask. Them, but... <laughs> anyway, continue. Um, sorry. Well, it's actually a pretty complex idea if you think about it. For one thing, consider how many times you've seen the future depicted in movies, and television, and books, with the complete absence of black people. I mean, forget about that. Think about how many times you've seen the present depicted in popular culture with the complete absence of black people, like various alternate versions of New York City that you've seen in some popular sitcoms that I won't bother naming. And it's not just about popular culture. Think about how much of our society is predicated upon the casual erasure, complete control or general elimination of black people. Consider for instance, in 1751, your boy Benjamin Franklin, he wrote, all Africa is black and tawny, Asia, chiefly tawny, America, exclusive of the newcomers, wholly so. And in Europe, the Spaniards, Italians, French, Russians, and Swedes are generally of what we call a swarthy complexion. I could wish that the faces, that the numbers of white people were increased. And while we are, as I may call it, scouring our planet by clearing America of woods, and so making this side of our globe reflect a brighter light to the eyes of inhabitants on Mars or Venus, why should we, in the sight of superior beings, darken its people? Why increase the sons of Africa by planting them in America when we have so fair an opportunity by excluding all blacks and tawnies of increasing the lovely white and red? But perhaps I am partial to the complexion of my country for such kind of partiality is natural to mankind. Yes, you heard it here. Benjamin Franklin wanted to stall the reproduction of black people in America so that the country would look whiter from space. That is deep. In March 2018, artist Alicia Wormsley was invited to participate in a project called The Last Billboard, where various artists were granted access to the billboard in Pittsburgh for a month at a time. Wormsley chose a simple, direct message for the billboard. There are Black people in the future. And I'll skip this part, but basically people ended up protesting the billboard, even though this had been you know, a years long uh, artistic project, and hers was the first one to inspire protest. So, you know, the, the long and short of it is, just the simple idea that black people continue to exist turns out to be a lot more radical than one might think, considering mm -hmm. how much of modern civilization has been predicated upon the complete elimination of black people and fantasizing about the complete elimination of black people. 
Well, what do you think about black people imagining their own futures? How do you, uh, you know, because we have, I think your analysis is fascinating there. And I, I think of, um, uh, I think it's Richard Pryor has this joke where he talks about seeing Star Wars and being like, they don't want this, you know. Mm -hmm. all, and well, no, you know, the first Star Wars, you know. Um, right, like, now, uh, now we're uh, hither and thither. Yeah, I should have, uh, uh, you know, I have my Star Wars Burger King uh, <laughs> Empire Strikes Back glasses. I should be drinking out of my Lando Calrissian one right they now. They might, they might want that for the museum. So yeah, don't, exactly. don't let them see that on camera. <laughs> but my point is, um, and you make this point, is how do you think Black folks imagine the future? You've talked a little bit about the distant past and how sure. the language, our language, uh, shapes that. But do you think of, uh, you know, what's the futuristic view? You know, from Sun Ra to, uh, you know. Outcast. How do we right. think of it? And do you have you thought about this? I assume. Yeah. Both of your characters have. Yeah. So I think that um, there are a couple things. First of all, you know, you mentioned the idea of, of Afrofuturism beginning in the 19th century, and I think that anytime Black people, like all dreams of emancipation, all dreams of abolition, to me, are inherently Afrofuturist dreams, right? People in the time of slavery, in order to imagine such a thing as abolition, such a thing as their own freedom, that was a, that was science fiction, right? That was speculative fiction. They had to um, they had to have the fortitude and the imagination and the intellectual strength to conceive of something that in the entirety of American existence had had never been, right? That the entirety of of their lives had never been. And I think about that a lot. Um, as a kind of, you know, um, the, the notion of imagination is kind of like a North Star for me sure. uh, across my work. And I think about imagination, the, having the courage to imagine, I think is the least that we owe those who came before us who had to imagine so much bigger and bolder and scarier than we can ever even conceive of. And so I think that we are thinking about black futures all the time, right? Like every every time you dare to think about, you know, being a parent or getting a job or fulfilling a dream, um, that that requires a kind of bold courage for black people that I think often goes um, unacknowledged. Um, and I also really love that you brought up like the, you know, the menagerie of weirdos. I, I'm so <laughs> grateful and inspired by so many Afrofuturist artists. And I think for some reason, specifically in music, right? So we think about people like Sun Ra, we think about, of course, Janelle Monet. Um, you know, we think about Outkast. Um, and you look at these folks and you're like, the, you know, like they are the ones who have the visual presentation and the kind of aesthetic courage to, um, to really push us to thinking about the future. Sure. Um, for me, one of my like OG Afrofuturist icons is, of course, Jordi LaForge, right? Um, portrayed inimitably by LeVar Burton. And I think that for me as a child, that was my first image of, you know, uh, and for some people it's Nichelle Nichols, right? It's a sure, you yeah. know, which generation of Star Trek you are. Um, but yeah, this image that like, that that there's a black man in the future who runs the ship, right? He's this sure. he's the scientist. Um, everybody, like he, he makes the crucial decisions to, to keep the ship functioning. And and that was really powerful to me. So, um, yeah, I, I think about that a lot. When I think about, I mean, gosh, we could have a Star Trek, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, geek out or, or Star Wars. You know, my dad loved Star Trek. We used to watch it. And it was harder to find then. You know, you couldn't right. just turn it on or stream it, you know, and we'd have to turn on like six o'clock on a Sunday and watch episodes, catch as catch can. And, you know, we all know or should and, um, you know, Michelle Nichols, such a powerful, her insistence on some of the aspects of that role. I right. Think, so powerful. Um, and, you know, wow. I mean, we could go on, but again, there's so many generative places, but I love what you said about the imagination. It's something I was trying to write about in the Grey album, because you have to imagine yourself in that fiction. Right. We can call it science fiction as a large part of that. And even the Negro spirituals have this coded quality of imagination and something like Ezekiel saw the wheel, it feels like it's uh, not just, you know, something biblical, but something right. transporting that, you know, the mothership descends from. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that's why I don't consider myself a religious person, but I, I am drawn to a lot of biblical imagery um, for exactly that reason, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's all, it's deeply, it's deeply futurist. 
Yeah. Well, and, you know, they, the afterworld was also, uh, it should be said, the afterlife that they were picturing was often Canada or right. Ohio or an actual place or okay. path. So that's, I think, what's complicated and interesting about Afrofuturism, um, you know, you can be born in the Carolinas, but really be born from outer space at the yes. same time. <laughs> um, so I, I love that. I want to uh, take a, a quick moment because we're going to have audience questions in a little bit um, to talk about comics and how they play into your idea of Afrofuturism. Did you always love comics? Did you approach Ironheart? Like, tell us just like a short way of how you got into it, and then also where you see that overlapping with. Uh, yeah. I'm freaking out a little because I'm working right now on a new comics thing that I can't tell you what it is. Oh my God. I almost I, like, oh, man. oh man, we got to get. I just put a, everybody just put a little bookmark in this moment because because I, 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 I you know they'll come for me. I can't tell you, but um, but it's something very cool and very thematically aligned nice. with our uh, conversation. So um. Yeah, so I grew up. I grew up reading comics, um, and also, you know, something I love about comics is that um, I always say they are. Uh, yeah, there's Ironheart, uh, one of my one of my little boos. Um, you know, something I love about comics, uh, which ties into a lot of the work that you know that you feature at the museum, is for me, comics is a it's an it's an American art form, yeah. right? Created by marginalized people at the time, created mostly by recent immigrants and, and children of immigrants uh, who are mostly Jewish in a very anti-Semitic time, right? Um, and I and I see comics as being aligned with hip hop and jazz um, as being these uh, American art forms that people think of as like being kind of trashy, right? <laughs> like being kind of vulgar and, and low culture. Um, and certainly jazz and to an extent hip hop has has sort of like ascended towards respectability. Um, you can make an argument about the movement of white people and whiteness into those respective spaces and how that plays a role, certainly when it comes to jazz, right? How, how that plays a role in the kind of newly perceived respectability of, of those art forms. That's for a music theorist to, to talk about, a musicologist to talk about. But, um, you know, I love that about comics. I love that they're kind of like, they're associated with young people. They're associated with being cheap. Um, they are serialized art forms. So, well, at least the type of comics I write is I write yeah. mo monthly okay. serial superhero comics, right? Which means like, whenever you have a serialized art form, um, we there's no binging. So it's like the last like super lo-fi. I mean, you can wait until trade paperbacks come out and, um, you know, read them all at once. But most, you know, a lot of us, we go to the comic book store and you get this really kind of crappy, floppy piece of paper sure. and you have to wait another month to see what happens. And so I, and because of that, the writing style, um, you know, we put a lot of pressure on like the cliffhanger, right? How do you get people to come back in a month, which is like 700 years, um, even before COVID time, a month before COVID time, a month was 300 years and now it's 700 years. Yeah, okay. um, <laughs> and so, you know, um, so those are just some things I love about the art form, but even almost to a degree, even lower art form than comics is like cartooning and comic strips, which I, which I also grew up uh, reading religiously and loving. Um, I oftentimes wouldn't even like check out the collection from the library. I would just sit and read the whole thing sure, like, yeah. in the corner <laughs> and then, then put it back, like carefully reshelve it and leave. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so, like, no, don't reshelve. <laughs> I'm like, I promise I remember exactly where I put it. Um, and so, you know, so I, I, but the thing is, is that one of the questions people ask me a lot is um, growing up that I think that I would write comics and I didn't. And the reason I didn't was because um, I never saw or heard of anybody who looked like me who, who did it. And, and in a sense, it was a failure of my own imagination, right? Like uh, I said this on a, a conversation with somebody the other night, like certainly Mae Jemison was able to be like, I should go to space. And she didn't, she didn't need somebody. She didn't need like another black woman to do it first. Although maybe it was Nichelle Nichols who inspired her to go to space. But you know, I didn't think that it was a, a, a viable thing that I would get to do. And so, um, and, and part of that is, you know, I'm Marvel has been around for something like 82 years. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm the fifth black woman in the history of the company to write for Marvel. And all of us are like very recent. It's not like yeah. we're yeah. not spaced yeah. out evenly over the, <laughs> the 80 whatever years. Yeah. And so, you know, part of, part of what I love that I get to do now um, the reason I love to write comics is because it is a space 
even maybe even more than poetry. I mean, I think this is true of poetry as well, but poetry doesn't always have this visual element. Both of these are spaces where you can do anything, like sure. anything. Sure. And in comics, I think in poetry, you can do anything. And I love that. In comics, not only can you do anything, but as a writer, I can write anything and somebody has to draw it and then it looks amazing. And the other thing is that in superhero comics, there's actually kind of a premium on not only doing anything, but like pushing yourself to come up with the absolutely most outrageous thing you possibly can. So, you know, I'm stepping into a legacy of a world where, you know, body doubles, people died and came back to life. People went to space, they came back from space. So, you know, you know, like right. uh, any and every wild thing that you can, it was aliens, aliens that look like people, like whatever you can come up with, someone has already done it probably like 40 years ago. And so just in terms of like creativity and imagination, oh my gosh, it puts such a premium on me to push, push, push. And I think that that's one of the biggest things that I've learned. And, and in terms of, you know, coming at it from an Afrofuturist lens, um, it means that this this idea of for me to be able to write mostly black characters um, and also, you know, I've gotten to write Kamala Khan, who's a Pakistani American Muslim teen girl nerd from New Jersey um, and, you know, lots of other great and I gotten to write Miles Morales and mm -hmm. um, to bring this idea of like absolutely anything is possible. Go big or go home to black life feels so special and cool and like such a privilege um, that I, I never stop. Like I, I never get over it. I never stop geeking out about it. Um, and it's really exciting. Um, so yeah, I love, I love doing it. And I think that what I'm able to bring to that space in a world where, you know, everything has already been done 40 years ago. Um, the thing that I'm able to bring is, or what I try to bring is just like the everyday valences of life for black people and specifically for, you know, often black girls and, um, and uh, the like kind of quiet, tender moments. And the thing, you know, the secret sauce of comics is that, um, you know, powers are great. Everybody loves powers. But I always say, and I'm, this is not an original thought. Lots of people have said this. But people come to comics not just for Spider-Man. They come for Peter Parker. Sure. But people want to know um, that there's a human beneath it who is like them that they can relate to. And for me, it's been really powerful to tell those kind of human stories, um, very tender uh, like quietly black feminist human stories um, in the midst of like fighting and shooting, which I also, I like the fighting and the shooting too. <laughs> well, well said. I mean, you really capture both in what you're thinking about, but also in the comics themselves, this humanity is what you're talking about and the fullness of a great character. And- um, Thank you, and I try. I, <laughs> well, and I, I, can you, if you have, if someone hasn't, uh, Red Ironheart or Champions. Can you just give us like the two minute version of what those two character, two books? Yeah, are? absolutely. Okay, so if you want to read Ironheart, you can read the entire, my entire 12 issue run. It's collected in a book called Ironheart colon meant to fly. It has right. a yellow cover. I have um, it. Yes, and th I say that because there are other versions that just have half or half of it. So okay. you want the whole story and get Ironheart meant to fly. And the two second version is that uh, Riri Williams, AKA Ironheart is a 15 year old black teen girl genius from Chicago who reverse engineers the Iron, suit by, the Iron Man suit by herself without the benefit of any of the money or technology that Tony Stark used to build his Iron Man suit. Um, she gets mentored by him and ultimately breaks out on her own and has to figure out how to be a good person. Uh, while also figuring out what it means to be a superhero and a black girl who has anxiety and like is a little bit of a misanthrope and is annoying to people. Uh, but I love her. And um, Champions is a superhero team. It's a teen superhero team um, that includes Riri and uh, Kamala Khan, aka Ms. Marvel and Miles Morales um, and Viv Vision and lots of other cool teen characters. And um, the series that I wrote on is called Outlawed, which you can also find at a local comic shop or independent bookstore near you. And uh, the premise of this story is that it becomes illegal to be a superhero if you are under 21 years old. Mm -hmm. And so all of the teen superheroes have to decide uh, what they're going to do in the face of this law. And so it's also about like ageism and youth and unjust law. And what do you do when you don't agree with the law? Do you break it or do you go underground? Um, so I try to bring a lot of uh, like politics into the work and it's super fun. 
So when's the movies? That's the <laughs> <laughs> well, you can catch the upcoming Ironheart series on Disney Plus uh, okay, coming sweet. in the future. And the head writer on that is uh, our fellow poet Shanaka Hodge. Um, there you go. If you want to see, if you ever thought, you know, if you're if you're trying to go into poetry and people tell you there's no future in poetry, you can be a poet and do anything. There's so. an Afro future in poetry. There's <laughs> an Afro future in poetry. For absolutely. Oh, that shirt. Get them printed up. Well, I mean, I think that this is a great time to turn to the audience and hear a little what they have for us. And I'll also uh, have a question or two, I'm sure, in the mix. Right. So, and I'll, I'll say my uh, any anybody who has a question about anything, I'm happy to answer it. So it's okay if it wasn't a question about what we just talked about. That's okay, great. Uh, well said. We have a moderator who will be coming on to help us with that. Hi, Director Young, Dr. Ewing. Thank you so much. That was a, a great conversation. I can listen to both of you talk all night. Um, I'm Matt Schindel. I'm a space history curator at the National Air and Space Museum. And I'm going to mo moderate the questions coming from the audience who, uh, if you do have a question, if you're in the audience, please drop that question into the chat so that it can then be uh, given to me so that I can ask it uh, to our panelists. Uh, before I get to the audience questions, I wanted to start with a question because, like I said, was really enjoying listening to the two of you talk and just the things that you're interested in and excited, get excited about. I wanted to know more. Um, what are you reading right now? What are you listening to? What are you watching that's really exciting and engaging you? Yeah, Kevin, do you want to go first? Um, well, running a museum, I don't have the kind of <laughs> to, to read things that I might. I mean, I'm mostly, you know, uh, read poetry um, in one of my other capacities. But in terms of um, writing, you know, I am uh, working on poems always and some nonfiction. Uh, some of that came out recently, a piece about Nancy Cunard. So I'm thinking a lot about uh, and her relationship to race, which I think is complicated and sometimes troubling and sometimes interesting and sometimes admirable. So um, I'm interested in that more widely. and. I'm writing a lot about uh, race and um, uh, death and censorship, um, all of which seem uh, afoot uh, lately. So uh, I'm trying to understand that. And comics definitely come in there uh, too. So cool. I am reading. So, okay. If there are comic book fans in the audience, they know. Well, I kind of I want to ask so many questions about being a, a space history curator, but I'll save that for later. I want to know everything about that. But <laughs> if there are comic book fans in the chat, you know that after a three-year hiatus, yesterday Saga by Brian K. Vaughn and, C and Fiona Staples returned, and I was trying to like grind away and get a lot of work done yesterday. So I didn't get to the comic book store, but it is in my box. Um, and I'm homies with the owner of the store. So he slid me like some, he told me he slid me some like stickers and tattoos and stuff like that. Um, so I'm very excited about that. If you haven't read Saga, if you, if you don't think of yourself as a comic book fan, um, I would highly recommend Saga. It's an amazing epic story about family and violence. Um, it is very explicit and not for kids at all. So uh, it's the art is really beautiful and young people will be like drawn to it, but it's not for children. Don't tell people, don't like, if you're a kid, don't tell your parents that I told you to read this because I didn't. Um, but Saga is amazing. So I'm waiting to pick that back up. Um, I've also been working through um, the amazing book, Black Food by Brian Terry, edited by Brian Terry. Um, I've been working through it because I do most of my reading before bed and it's like a really big hardcover book. And so I, it's always like kind of unwieldy <laughs> to bring it into bed with me. And also because it is such a feast. It's an amazing, beautiful photographs, incredible essays. I, I don't know what I expected from the book, but it is um, so much richer and more complex and thorough and beautiful and thoughtful than than anything I anticipated. So I would highly recommend that. Oh, great. Well, I, I've been told that Saga is getting a lot of love in the chat. <laughs> yes, so, all the Saga fans. Yeah, um, it's better than me. I, I, uh, well, there was a really bad cliffhanger before this three-year hiatus. Oh my God. Um, I'm going to get into it. I'm, you know, I'm totally behind on comics. I'll, I'll, I'll be if you want to cry and be sad, this is well, <laughs> this yeah. one for you. I mean, it's COVID, so I... Yeah, hey, it's nice vibes. vibes. I did have one question before you jump into audience questions. but just about the term Afrofuturism, and maybe we can end with that. So let's let's keep going. But um, I'm just curious because I know Nanetti Okorafor, for instance, 
prefers the term African futurism. Some people are you even brought up sort of the arguments around it. What do you think about that as a term? Yeah, you know, um, I have, you know, Nettie has made her position very clear on this. Um, I respect that, that that is a position she feels strongly about. And I, I think that she has the right to think about how she wants to define her work. Sure, of course. Um, one of her critiques of Afrofuturism, though, is that it, from her perspective, um, it is very much rooted in United States traditions and people who are descendants of, you know, Jim Crow and, and people who grew up in the sure. U.S. And I would really I, that part I do disagree with, because I think it's important for us to have a global and di I think Afrofuturism is global and diasporic and can encompass, you know, so many and has encompassed so much work from black people around the globe. Um, and I think that, you know, it was invented by Mark Derry, who's a white guy. So and, and I'm not so into the future part. Um, but like a lot of words like that are imperfect. I'm a feminist and, you know, feminism isn't just for women. It's for trans people and queer people and non-binary people and men. And so, you know, I don't know, this is the word we have. So I'll probably, until I, and unless somebody comes up with something better, uh, that's what I got. Sure. Great. All right. Um, so, uh, questions from the audience. Uh, Amber, Amber says, I believe our enslaved ancestors were Afrofuturists as well. And it leads me to chafe at the phrase, I am my ancestor's wildest dream. I'm interested in the speaker's thoughts on this. Wow. I have thoughts. <laughs> you start, you go then. Oh, okay. Um, I, so I don't want my thoughts to be perceived as haterish because um, I respect that. I think a lot of people, when they wear that phrase, like on a shirt or, you know, wherever, I understand the sentiment behind it. And I, I think the sentiment behind it is important, which is like taking a moment to celebrate all of the people who had to sacrifice for you to come to this moment. And I am all about that. Um, I think that my ancestors were complicated, ratchet, imperfect, petty, good sometimes, not good sometimes, human beings. Um, and I think that part of affording them humanity means not seeing them as simply avatars for my own for like me like i'm the end, i'm the end point i'm the gold at the end of the rainbow like we made it guys you know like uh that 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 i like to think they had a life that didn't involve they weren't thinking about me like they they had a life that didn't involve me um and or maybe or maybe maybe they were thinking about me and they they did dream of of me or something like me or something like my life but i think that projecting that onto them is um it feels like turning them into a symbol or an object as opposed to people so if we're thinking about ancestors as like a general symbolic way of talking about the past and also ancestors as like the ghosts and spirits with whom we are now in relation I think that's different. But if we're talking about like, you know, our great, great, greats, um, you know, I want them to have been like silly people, <laughs> you know, the same way all of us are. And um, that's, I have a short story about that in my first book, Electric Arches, uh, called The Device. Um, that is basically, it's a, a bunch of black people get together to build a device that allows you to talk to your ancestors. And it turns out that like when they go to talk to their ancestors, it's not what they thought it was going to be. Um, because ancestors are regular people. So those are my thoughts. With love and respect for anyone who is maybe wearing that shirt right this moment. Well said. I mean, I think the ancestor part is the emphasis, really. You know, people are trying to acknowledge ancestry in ways that, you know, uh, people said didn't exist. You know, when we were building the museum, um, you know, I wasn't there, but people would didn't believe it could be done. And some people thought it shouldn't be done. Uh, they thought they couldn't fill the museum with these objects that people had kept for, in a way, in an Afro, in a way, thinking of the future, knowing they were important, they were aspects of the past, but that there'd be one moment handing them down, even like Harriet Tubman's shawl, um, uh, her hymnal, you know, knowing that one moment they would reside somewhere. So, um, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think the emphasis really, to me, is on the continuity and that continuum of connection. That's what impresses me when I'm in the museum, um, which someone, by the way, said to me, they were like, oh, isn't that that uh, museum that looks like a spaceship on the Mar? I was like, oh, well, it's not a spaceship. I was like, but, you know, if you want to think of it that way, uh, it is uh, headed somewhere. So, Yes. What else? 
All right. Well, we have a, a question from Laura. Laura says, most of the time we hear about hope, and I would love to hear your thoughts about grief in relation to Afrofuturism, including wow. how we relate to the past and also in relation to the non-linearity of time and in relation to activism that comes out of Afrofuturist visioning. That's a big old question. I love it. Mm -hmm. I, I, it reminds me of something I didn't ask you, which was about the post-apocalyptic vision of the world or... Uh, Why know, post <laughs> when we were in the apocalypse right now? <laughs> well, the, the, the mid- I can't really wiggle my eyebrows, but I'm always trying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, but uh, why don't you take it away? What do you sure. think? Honestly, Laura, this might be like top 10 favorite questions I've ever been asked in any event, because I actually, to borrow the previous asker's phrase, I chafe at, um, there's this thing that I feel that black writers are asked about hope at every event. So like oftentimes all my books are like m super sad. Mine and the robot is not that sad, but a lot of my books are like hella sure. sad. So I go to these events and I give like a super sad talk and then people are like, what gives you hope? And I'm like, I don't mind it though. I'm not a big, I'm not a big, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in hope the way Miriam Kaba talks about it, which is, she says hope is a discipline, right? So if you think about hope as like an active thing that one does in praxis, then I'm all for it. But oftentimes I think people, um, think of hope as being fairly passive and really what they're asking me for at the end of, when they ask that question or any black writers who they ask that question is like, can you absolve me <laughs> worrying about all the sad things that you just told me? Cause I, it really bummed me out. So I really appreciate this question, which I see as the antithesis of that. Um, and I, I really just want to co-sign the kind of assertions that were in the question, which is, I think grief is really important. I think mourning is really important. I think that taking space, to intentionally um, remember and pray to and talk to and commune with and miss the people that we have lost is critical to um, the kind of relationship between the past and the future that I like to dream of. Um, and I think that, that mourning practices are, I think that in recent years, we've started to pay more attention to how black people are not allowed to grieve or are not allowed to have joy. But I also think we need to pay attention to how black people are often not allowed to grieve. Um, and I think about this even with the, the Mamie Teal Mobley example, right? And what does it mean for a black mother to be called upon to grieve in public or to feel the obligation to grieve in public for the good of a nation that then continues to not do right by the memory of her son? Right. America has never done right by, by Emmett Till. So maybe maybe Till Mobley gave us everything and then and it was squandered by this country. And, you know, did she have the opportunity to to simply grieve, um, to hold her hurt in whatever way felt right to her without obligations to a, an unworthy nation? You know, so, um, yeah, I'm really I think grief is really, really important. And I'm really grateful for the question. It's a great question, I think, and a great answer. The only thing I might add is I, I edited a book of grief poems uh, called The Art of Losing. And one of the things I thought about a lot is the way black people grieve, or I would say there's grief, which is private and you're feeling, and then mourning, which is often traditions. And that mourning is um, you know, often centered, as we might know, around food. The repast is so crucial. There's always this kind of connection to the living, doesn't mean, and also the, the, the person passed or uh, transition, uh, as folks say. Um, yeah, or home go. We have home goings, right? Home goings, so, so even that is like I'm I'm continuing on to a place. Yeah. So I, I would. The only thing I would add is that there's a, also a layer of trying to understand our morning rituals, which are inflected and and changed, and often, you know, New Orleans. It, it has a kind of, it's not joy exactly, uh, though I think it's true what Toy Derricotte says, joy is an act of resistance. There is, uh, and Lucille used to sign all her uh, books, joy. And I was like, I know, I, I think I understood her best when I understood that that wasn't like joy, you know? Right, right. joy and happiness are not the same thing. Yeah, it's like an effort at, yes. and a wish for, and a practice, as you said, that's really well said. And so I, I think we are trying to balance those morning uh, moments and those moments of joy and how do we understand them fully? Well said. Great. Um, we have a question from Maria and Maria asks uh, for Dr. Ewing, can you share a little more on how you encourage adults to hold on to 
this necessary imagination that you've discussed versus how you encourage kids to do the same? Oh, that's a great question. You know, I think that I, I like that the question takes for granted that I do that or that I do that well, or maybe they're asking how they should do it. But um, I think that for adults, I think we underestimate how political, how imagination is inherently so political. Um, and I really think of it, I often use the phrase like cultivating imagination because related to our last question, I think of this as a thing that we practice. And so I find, re, re, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, that I find that there are people in my life, people I've encountered professionally or personally, who their disposition to the unknown is toward like curiosity and possibility and inquiry. And I think that there are people for whom their disposition to the unknown is um, fear and hesitation. And I don't mean the unknown, like, oh, sh like serious things. I mean, like in the workplace, like what if we used a different type of copy paper, right? <laughs> that like, that there are people who get so into the habit of like, if something is new, it must be scary or it must be impossible. Um, that it, it really just becomes like a muscle that you work in one direction or, or another. And so, you know, the same way when you're starting to work out, you have to like practice with little muscle thing. Maybe you do five minute workout or if you're trying to run, you start do your walk run intervals. I would encourage adults to like try to, you know, just practice imagining a little bit, <laughs> you know, in small increments on a regular basis. And I think about that when we, I think one great way to do that is in the arena of social problems, right? And so, what and for me this is very much related to what i would consider a black feminist ethic of care so for me one of the most intentional imaginings that i try to do every day is when faced with any type of conflict i ask myself what would it look like to resolve this in a way that is rooted in an ethic of caring for everyone involved rather than punishing people right that is like a small thing because because so much of our world is a culture of punishment that I find that just by asking myself that question, what would, it, what would it look like if we were just trying to care for people? That often that brings us to very simple solutions. We would give them food, we would give them books. We would, you know, I, when I was a teacher, I remember we were having a staff meeting and somebody was complaining about, uh, all the kids at our school were black. And somebody, a teacher was complaining about kids losing pencils too much. And all they do is ask for pencils all day. And she, you know, she was like, and I have a strategy and I charge them five cents for every time they don't, you know, she had all these like tricks and tips to like deal with pencil economy. And my principal was like, just give them a pencil. Like we have pencils. We broke. We're not that broke. Like, damn, y'all need pencil money. Put in a requisition for some pencils right. because we get so in, and that's the microcosm of how we get so into all these other contor mental contortions rather than imagining the most straightforward thing, which is just to like care and provide people with the things that they need. So that that is one kind of intervention of imagination that I try to engage in on a daily basis. The other thing is that once you get into this, you start to realize that um, that oftentimes the thing that feels so impossible to you is something lots of people have dreamed and written about before. <laughs> and that things that feel, you know, here I'm, I'm probably not so obliquely speaking about things like prison and police abolition, right? That, that all the, what you think of your brilliant question on these topics is like, oh, I've probably somebody thought about that already and like wrote about it and they probably did it like 20 years ago. And I think that inviting yourself to be in conversation with, you know, thinkers and ideas that are unfamiliar to you is another great way to cultivate imagination. Um, I don't, I think kids are so imaginary already that I don't have great ideas. Uh, Although I've, I've started asking, here's my one gimme for, for like kids' imagination. I started asking kids, um, if you, it's 50 years from now and you are an elderly person and you are visiting a school where they've invited you to come speak and tell the kids what the pandemic was like in history, what do you tell them? Like, what's your speech for these kids? Um, and I find that that is like a, gives a lot of really interesting um answers that also invite some imagination about the present. So that's, that's my one good idea for some kids imagining. And then just like drawing, making puppets, you know, the usual. That's great. We're Thank gonna, you, we're, we're, we're at time, but we're gonna ask one last question. Um, this one comes from Jasmine and Jasmine wants to know, how do you imagine freedom? What does that look like, feel like? Um, what's your take on that? 
Kevin, you got to go first for this one. <laughs> uh, well, a quote I always uh, think about and someone I think about in the context of some of what we've been saying is Toni Morrison. And she, as she says, uh, the function of freedom is to free someone else. And, and that idea, I think, is part of what freedom means. Freedom means, uh, you know, being able to do what you wish, all those things. But it isn't mean free from other people or free from responsibility. If anything, it means an additional responsibility. And, you know, the folks in our museum, uh, I think, and I, I think of the portrait of Harriet Tubman as a young woman, which uh, we share with the Library of Congress, um, with her sitting, just looking at you. And I've seen that look from my grandmother, from other women of uh, uh, my family, just it, it's a forward looking look, but also a look that goes through you, you know? Mm -hmm. They're looking into something beyond it. And that's that feeling to me. Uh, and that's a feeling we try to capture in the museum. Um, we have a new show called Reckoning, which thinks about uh, what we call living history in this current moment, but and also includes, I think, uh, this important portrait of, it doesn't, I, I know it does include, the portrait of Breonna Taylor by Amy Sherrill, but she's looking at a portrait by Bisa Butler based on that photograph. Uh, uh, and it's a beautiful textile and quilt looking, at, and these two people looking at each other, the force field, as I call it, that you stand in when you're seeing them is is about freedom in some way and then about um, uh, not just tragedy, but also something on the other side of it. Um, and, and that kind of connection, that kind of look ahead is one of the points to me of freedom. Oh, wow. I don't know if I have anything to add to that. I, you know, the first thing that comes to mind is the Nina Simone quotation where she says, freedom to me is no fear. And I think that fear, being afraid is a natural part of being alive on this planet or whatever other planets we might find ourselves on, you know? Um, and so I think I would extend that to say freedom to me is the being enveloped by the kind of loving beloved community that you're describing Kevin to know that whatever fear you may encounter is surmountable, you know, that you have your people with you. Um, and I also think like for me, true freedom would be so mundane that I wouldn't even think about it, right? Like when you see a bunch of five-year-olds running on a playground, you look at them and you're like, this is the most freest thing I've ever seen in my life. And they're not thinking that at all. They're not thinking about any of that, right? They, the, the, the total absence of um, even having to construct such a thing. And so maybe if we were truly free, we wouldn't even have a word for freedom because it would have no counterfactual, you know? Um, yeah. Well said. Well, on that note, I want to thank you both, Dr. Ewing, Director Young. This has been a wonderful conversation. And thank you also to the, the audience members uh, and those who submitted questions. We hope that you will continue to join us over the next couple of days for these conversations as, as they keep going. And, um, you know, uh, again, just thank you both. It was, it was a wonderful discussion. Thank you. I'm incredibly humbled and honored to have been here and excited for the rest of the symposium. Likewise. Thanks.